We've just seen a series of different kinds of stresses and their impact on the ecosystem. But I wanted to highlight with this video that stresses on ecosystems rarely apply in isolation. Today, for example, there is one cause responsible for multiple stresses impacting lots of ecosystems at once, and this is anthropogenic human-driven activity. And this is a pattern that we also see in the fossil record, an event or an event driver um, will often drive multiple stresses at once. Think about uh, meteorite impacts, for example, driving extinctions. Hence, working out how stresses interact is really important. Are they additive or are they multiplicative, for example? Indeed, the present state of um, modern ecosystems probably reflects a complex cumulative history of stress and stress release. And so by using the fossil record, we can dig into that history and hopefully understand it slightly better. So let's have an introduction to multiple stresses and then dig into some examples of those. So I'll start off with the bad news. Interactions among multiple stresses are thought to lead to biologically different outcomes, um, in both qualitatively and quantitatively, from those produced by single stresses. So adding these things together makes them um, significantly different. This means we do need to understand how stresses interact with one another if we want to enhance the resilience of our ecosystems. The good news is that the fossil record, such as this beautiful fossil, dra fossil dragonfly on the left hand side here, um, can help us prov by providing insights. So the fossil record can allow us to identify events that may warn of imminent collapse of an ecosystem or interfere with its recovery. They may reveal feedbacks or processes that have stabilized ecosystems in the past. They allow us to recognize interactive effects amongst multiple stresses, and we can see if they could should they amplify or deaden the impacts of individual stresses, as shown on this graph in the middle here. We would expect these stresses to amplify each other. Uh, the fossil record allows us to gain insights into the duration of lag effects in the ecosystem response and also to assess controls on slow processes of e in ecosystems, which we wouldn't necessarily be able to um, follow by, fo by uh, studying these things in real time. And they allow us to quantify um, the effects and frequencies of rare events in ecosystems and the, the time that's needed to recover from them. So let's spend the rest of this video meeting a few examples to illustrate these points. The first I wanted to introduce is an idea of a thing called a threshold event. A threshold event is a sudden change in the state of an ecosystem, um, sometimes after a prolonged period of stability, um, often in spite of sustained or intensifying stress in the recent past. So you stress an ecosystem and not much happens, then suddenly you get a switch in ecosystem state. Fossils provide us with a long-term perspective, which is important for studying these, and they allow us to identify the nature of threshold events in the past. A nice example of this is from the paper that I have cited here by Brush and Hill Gartner in 2000. This looked at submerged vegetation communities and the impact of human disturbance since the European settlement of the US. And it did so by mapping changes in species composition and abundance in tributaries of the upper Chesapeake Bay. You can see a photo of this here. It's on the east coast of the US next to Delaware, if you're interested. And this map shows the same area. And these authors have used um, a load of drill cores, which are marked by the black circles in these map, to try and understand the changes in aquatic vegetation over the time. In the early 1970s, we see a sudden loss of submerged aquatic vegetation in this area. And this is a bit unexpected because water quality changes, such as nutrient stress, had been occurring in the estuary for more than a century. At first, biologists suggested this change, which included the species that's shown on the right-hand side here, um, was a natural fluctuation in the population. However, seeds preserved from the, um, in the cores that these authors um, collected for this study spanned the last 2,000 years and showed that this change was actually due to changes in land use and the increased use of fertilizers in, the, um, in this area and the associated runoff. So this is an example of a threshold event these authors are able to say through this study that was driven by human activity. So it's useful to be able to understand these things. 
Fossils can also help us detect whether increased variability in ecosystems or slower rates of recovery from disturbances might be early warning signs of impending major changes. And this is posited as an idea to be the case on a range of scales. So often we will think that um, changes in variability on a local or regional or global scale or a slow recovery from a disturbance could be indicative of things being about to kick off and uh, the ecosystem being about to change. A nice example of this is based on diatoms, such as shown on the left and the right hand side here, from sediment cores that can help us understand the changes in a eutrophic lake in Yunnan in China. So it's this paper here led by Wang from 2012. So eutrophic lakes are these lakes that are rich in nutrients and that leads to lots of life when there are lots of nutrients which then dies and decays leading to oxygen depletion. These authors looked at diatom occurrences and were combined with a mathematical model and they looked more specifically into something called flickering. This is a back and forth switch as represented by this graph here between two alternative stable ecosystem states in response to environmental stress. So this is a zoomed in version of what we might expect to see in this flickering state. This modeling and the diatom records suggested that flickering precedes a sudden shift to an alternative stable eutrophic lake condition in this lake in the early 2000s. So we see this by the increasing wobbling on this graph of phosphorus concentrations on the bottom before this blip to a higher phosphorus concentration. And we've got this 10 to 30 year interval of flickering recorded in our sediment cores after nearly 750 years of relatively low variability in the composition and diversity of the diatom community. So that suggests that actually these flickering events may be one way to predict uh, an impending ecosystem change and hopefully allow us to, um, to try and counteract those quickly if we were in a position to do so. But do also see um, this comment here, which suggested that this could be an artifact of how the data were analyzed. A current worry that we have is that multiple stresses are interacting and causing abrupt ecosystem changes. When that happens, we need to work out what is having the biggest impact and what that impact is. So we can understand that a little bit better by looking at some examples from reef ecosystems. So observations of Caribbean reef corals show that they have suffered a dramatic decline, I'm sorry to say, since the 1980s. The onset and intensification of coral disease and bleaching is attributed to anthropogenic climate change. And of course, fossils and the rock record can help us put all of that in context. So they allow us to show the unprecedented nature of these changes and help us to untangle the impact and the role of contributing stresses. The study that I've chosen to illustrate this today for you is looking at Panama back reef communities, the kind that are shown on the left and in the middle here. So these um, Caribbean communities at locations that are shown as numbered circles in this map on the right hand side here. The references uh, associated with this are shown on the slide. And they look at the impact of high sediment and high nutrient runoff from agricultural lands. And these papers, these studies, suggest that this is driving a shift to a new dominant coral species following millennia of dominance by another. So we're getting a, a change in the corals that are alive. It also, these studies show changes that um, have led to a much simplified food web with a threshold cost, perhaps as recently as the 1970s. So we're getting a change in our species diversity, the species that are alive at the time here, and that are alive right now, I should say, and a simplified food web as a response to these changes. I also mentioned that time series of fossil data can be used to identify feedbacks. And the example here is um, I've got is drawn from a paper by Islander Booth in 2012. Now these authors used paleoecological data from cores to chart an ecosystem state shift in a wetland area in Pennsylvania. They showed that deforestation by European settlers in an adjacent area, so not this area itself, triggered a change in Titus Bog, which is an Erie County, a bog that's shown on the right hand side here. They, for, I think, clearly document that there was this land clearance that led to more wind erosion of exposed soil. 
that wind erosion of exposed soil in turn led to greater transport of nutrients into this wetland. The wetland plant community then changed from having uh, being moss dominated to having more vascular plants. And that was then coupled with higher decomposition rates because nutrient enrichment stimulated microbial decomposition. This, in turn, allowed more rapid nutrient cycling and a new post-settlement ecosystem state to form. So we've got a picture here where upland deforestation by European settlers triggers a cascade of ecological changes that are shown in this, um, this flow diagram here. And it demonstrates to us that indirect, often unintended and overlooked human disturbances will lead to dramatic structural and functional changes of carbon-rich wetland ecosystems, highlighting the potential vulnerability of these systems in human-dominated landscapes. So what does the future hold? Hopefully not anything that's quite as bleak as um, this image from the Drudge Dread movie that's shown on the uh, slide here. But what I have shown you over the course of these slides on conservation and paleobiology is that research is entering a new era beyond the applied use of geohistorical records to understand the effects of single environmental stresses. Today, we're moving into an area where we're starting to try and untangle multiple stresses. More work is needed to improve understanding of the dynamics of, interac of interactions in such events and their consequences on biological systems. But bear in mind, there are challenges in conservation paleobiology that makes these um, developments that I think we desperately need to understand the impact that we're having slightly challenging. Those challenges include quantifying the resolution and fidelity of the um, fossil assemblages that we use to understand changes in ecosystems. We need to understand better how we scale between kind of short term and longer term paleobiological data and how we can use the latter to inform the former because these cover vastly different temporal and spatial scales. How do we compare them? We need to continue developing proxies for environmental and biotic conditions. Um, at present, these are rarely calibrated to the accuracy and precision of our instrumental data. So um, long term, more developments are needed. That brings us to the end of what I want to say about conservation by paleobiology, because in my next and final video, I'm going to be talking about geoheritage. But do bear in mind that I've picked for you here a series of examples about this from this what I think is a really useful and quickly developing field and you can find more information if you want it in this paper that I've put at the bottom here which provides a nice overview of the field as it has developed over the last couple of decades. So I hope that was interesting and I'll see you for our final video on geoheritage very very shortly.